Right, welcome to class, everybody. Nice to see you all. Uh, so, in principle, we are recording, I think. Yeah, recording. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, before we get started, let's see what announcements do we have. Uh, uh, was the uh, quiz last week uh, uh, suitably uh, easy? Cool. Then we did our job. Uh, fantastic. Really, again, this is just to make sure you guys at least open the course material once a week and, and think about this stuff. Um, if you're wondering, my exams will not be like that. Uh, so don't, don't be uh, you know, lulled into a false set of, 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 of easy quiz feelings. You should study hard for this class. Uh, beyond that, let's see, your homework is due Thursday, that's right, so, so in two days. Uh, how many of us have started the homework? Fantastic. Um, stage right. Uh, so, so that's great. Um, let's see here. So I think many thanks to the poor math grad student who seems to be catching all of the typos in the assignment. But uh, as far as we know now, it, it seems to be uh, 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 accurate up to the science. It's, it's interesting, you know, when you write this stuff for the last, what, 10, 15 years, you just become blind to that kind of typo. There's like some interesting psychological effect there. Like I really don't see it until someone points it out. But you do, so, so that's fun. Uh, but in any event, no, I, I, think, I think the homework is fine. Um, possibly up to the extra credit problem, but it's an extra credit problem, so that, that's on you. Um, Beyond that, uh, in terms of logistical stuff, as soon as that homework comes in, we will post the next one. The next one will be a little more coding intensive. Um, I don't know if there's less theory or if it's just a bigger homework all the way around, but <laughs> hopefully it's a reasonable balance. Uh, so in the next homework, you're going to derive and implement the as rigid as possible shape deformation algorithm, which is a popular from computer, uh, computer graphics community. Uh, incidentally, on that homework, we will grade for correctness and not efficiency of your code. <laughs> um, so one thing that you'll find is that like you're going to implement a little thing that like takes a 3D armadillo and like you know you pull out a point and it like deforms to to respond to your input. Um, if you pull out a point and then like 10 seconds later the shape clicks into place, that's perfectly fine. Um, but if you want a good coding uh, challenge, getting this thing like the algorithm in principle can run in in, in 30 frames a second. It's it's a real time thing. Uh, in fact, the the mesh that we give you on the homework is pretty low resolution. Um, but actually coding that in Python is, is a giant headache. I, I kind of struggled with it. One of my, my postdocs, actually he's not even a postdoc anymore, he's an alumnus who's now on the faculty at USC, got kind of interested in it and coded up this like blazingly fast solution that is completely unreadable to me. Um, but anyway, I, I, you don't have to worry about that for, for full credit. Okay, so I think that's all of my logistical things. Um, any questions, comments, concerns? Fantastic, uh, and we'll po hopefully post the grades for your first quiz on, uh, you did already, fantastic. So they're on some, somewhere between Gradescope, Piazza, and, and the third one, Canvas. Fantastic, um, there are far too many online tools and they talk to each other in extremely shaky fashion, but in principle, uh, it should be there. Um, cool, okay, so. Uh, unless there are any other questions, we'll, we'll dive right into the, the technical discussion for today. Uh, and we're continuing in the numerical linear algebra universe. And our goal today is to introduce at least one more matrix factorization to our pantheon of ways that we can factor a matrix. Okay? So, if you recall, in our previous lecture, we justified, um, was it one lecture or two lectures? I don't know. Time flies when you're teaching numerical analysis. Um, essentially, we, we showed that we can take a matrix and factor it as a product of a lower uh, triangular matrix times an upper one, right? This is called the LU factorization. Or if we really want it to exist for every possible input, then to take care of pivoting, we had to throw a P in there, right? And then at the, toward, in the second half of our previous lecture, we spent a little bit of time just seeing where different linear problems come up in nature, <laughs> right? And one of the very common things that we did uh, which, which I think is, is probably a story that you guys have all encountered in other courses, because this is a graduate class at MIT, is that there's a very common optimization problem that comes in many forms. So it basically looks like this, where I'd like to solve AX equals B, but maybe A is inaccurate or it's not square. So instead of um, inverting A, we, we sort of find the X that minimizes the difference between AX and B. Right? This problem is called least squares because, well, it's equivalent to squaring the objective function. And um, just for a tiny amount of review, uh, how, do we, how do we solve this problem if, if the only piece of software we have on our computer is code for Gaussian elimination? And I guess matrix multiply. 
put differently, like, like this thing can be solved with a linear system of equations, uh, what would that system be? I know you know the answer, and you're just being quiet, and you're, 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 putting, you're making your instructor miserable waiting for someone to raise their hand. It's the opposite of abnormal equations. Normal equations, fantastic. And what are the normal equations to recover x from a and b? Oh, you guys are killing me. Oh, you gotta Google it, really? No, come on. <laughs> In the time where I've like done my, Fur my, my Ferris Bueller routine, you could have like worked it out on your scrap paper. That's right. Henry, Harry? Harry. Yeah, so he's got it absolutely right. A transpose AX equals A transpose B. Yeah, that's right. You're, in fact, you're the only one. Yeah, you and, and RTA. Uh, no, <laughs> and Axel. Uh, OK, uh, uh, right. So, so, so in any event, um, you know, A may not be square, but A transpose A is. Um, this is a linear system of equations, right? We, we derived it by just taking the derivative of this and setting it to 0, Yeah, which is what we do for optimization stuff. Um, and now we can solve it with Gaussian elimination. Now, the question that we're going to answer today is, can we do better than that, <laughs> right? Um, either from a numerical stability perspective or efficiency or both, right? Um, and in particular, uh, what did we do last time? We took our matrices and we factored them as a product of a lower and an upper triangular uh, thing, right? So, so I take maybe M and use M instead of A because I already have an A there. And I write it as like LU. But notice that like, I mean, I could set LU equal to A transpose A here. But somehow like spiritually this feels wrong. <laughs> Because like somehow we have two matrices here that like we don't know much of a relationship between them. But this is a very nice matrix. This is symmetric, right? And so somehow like this thing doesn't look symmetric. And so that's our, our sort of clue that like maybe we can do a little better, right? In particular, you know, what we're going to try and do today is to justify a slightly different factorization, LL transpose. <laughs> Notice this is an LU factorization, right? Because this is upper triangular. Um, but uh, it, it required our matrix to be symmetric and positive definite. So let's make sure that we remember what these uh, terms mean. <laughs> so in general, uh, today, like in, in the higher level point, which is what's on our, our PowerPoint slide here, or really LaTeX slide that I converted to PowerPoint because of this camera, um, is that uh, you know Gaussian elimination can solve any square linear system, but it may not be the best algorithm. Right? It's just an algorithm. And in particular, the more we know about our matrix, the better we can do. Right? And so like, we've, we've seen some examples of this. There are many, many more. Um, these are examples of what we call structured linear systems. Um, so the examples we saw last time were uh, systems that are positive, definite, and sparse. Now, in particular here, let's justify that A transpose A is positive, definite, and symmetric. By the way, these terms usually go together. We don't usually see positive, definite, asymmetric matrices. Uh, but in any event, let's, 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 let's make a matrix M. We'll call it A transpose A. Now, I claim that M satisfies two very important properties. Like, so important. Hella important if you're in Northern California. Okay? So in particular, M, one, is symmetric. Right? Because if I write M transpose, that is A transpose A transpose. But remember how transpose works? It, like, distributes and you flip the order of the product at the same time. So this is A transpose. That's this guy times A transpose transpose, which is just A, which is M. Victory mark. OK, uh, and moreover, it is positive definite, PD, if I'm being lazy. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to take, uh, the first thing we'll do is check PSD, which is positive semi-definite. In order to do that, we're going to take uh, a vector V in Rn, OK? And now uh, we can compute the following quantity, which is uh, V transpose M V, like that. OK, so let's substitute in our definition of uh, M. So this is V transpose A transpose A V, like that. And now I'm just going to parenthesize it a little bit differently. This is A V transpose A V, like that. But notice this is a vector now, right? A times V is a vector. So this. What is this expression? This is a dot product between a v and itself, right? So secretly, the secret, um, this is really like that, right? 
And what do we know about norms? What's the first thing we know about norms? It's actually the only thing. Yeah, they're positive. Actually, that's not true. There are a lot of properties about norms, but that's, that's one of them. Okay? Um, so a positive semi-definite uh, matrix is one where if I take any vector v, um, we can show that v transpose times our matrix times v is a positive number. And kind of spiritually what's going on here, and what we'll kind of actually verify in lecture today, is that positive semi-definite matrices are sort of like the least squares of matrices. Like they're the ones that kind of correspond to a norm squared. Right? In particular, notice that if I took a positive semi, like what we're going to prove, spoiler alert, is the following, that I can take any positive uh, definite matrix, and I can write it as um, M equals LL transpose, where L is lower triangular. But notice that like up to using the letter L here, this proof still would have worked. So like secretly when I do V transpose MV, really what I'm doing is computing the norm of V in this kind of rotated L basis. So like somehow positive definite matrices are like just like some kind of coordinate rotation secretly if you, go, if you only knew that L. Um, in fact, that L is not unique until we, we put some more conditions on it. Okay, uh, right. So, so in any event, um, oh no, I already got ahead of myself. Um, this, this is like an example of a ridiculously important matrix, this A transpose A, uh, largely because it has these two properties. By the way, positive definite here means that in addition to that, if V is non-zero, then this is strictly positive. Okay? Um, we're actually not going to need that today. But that, 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 like, otherwise, uh, this matrix isn't invertible. Okay, sometimes, by the way, this matrix is called the Graham matrix. I'm sure Graham is a famous mathematician whose history I've completely forgotten. Um, he also shows up, uh, shows up in Graham Schmidt, fun fact. And in um, early versions of those neural things. <laughs> Right, the Gram matrix was like super popular as a way to make those like neural things that take in an image and make it look like Monet. Yeah, I forget why. I, it was never clear to me why those people were using these things. Um, okay, so in any event, as we just verified on the board, A transpose A has two really specific uh, properties to it. It's symmetric. We showed positive semi-definiteness. To check positive definiteness, we need an additional uh, property, which is that the columns of A are linearly independent. Um, right? Yeah, I guess that's right. Um, so I'll let you guys think through that one at home. Um, okay. So what we're going to show is that, like, because again, notice, like, essentially, what do we do? We, we want to solve like some matrix times x equals b, but now, but now I know a little bit more about my matrix. I know that it can be written this way because that's how I got it to begin with. Yeah. And now that additional piece of information is going to give us a new matrix factorization. You know, like repeat myself six times with every fun fact today. Make sure we remember it. Okay, so here's going to be our, our, our way of actually deriving this factorization, is we're going to go through the steps of Gaussian elimination specifically for this nicely structured matrix, and we're going to show that like a really a magical thing happens. And then we're going, to, we're going to use that magical fact to derive a nice form for our, our LU factorization. That's our plan. Okay? So in particular, by the way, I'm going to try to avoid using the letter A because I don't want confusion between A transpose A and A. So instead, let's switch to a matrix C, <laughs> okay? So we're trying to solve CX equals D. See, totally new letters, no confusion at all. Um, and what we'd like to do is maybe apply some version of Gaussian elimination or LU factorization to C, but our eventual goal is gonna be one that tries to preserve the symmetry and positive definite structure that we kind of like in C. Okay, that's our, that's our plan. Watch keeps buzzing. Okay. So generically speaking, I can take any, we did this a lot in this class, by the way. Like remember when we talked about Gaussian elimination, we like just put X's in a matrix for like entries that we don't know anything about. I'm gonna use a similar strategy here. I'm gonna take a, a big matrix C. You can tell it's big because I wrote a big C, okay? And I can think of this as, well, I'm going to take the very first, like the upper left element of C, right? I'm going to call that like C11, so that's just a scalar value. And I'm going to take the rest of the first column, and I'm just going to call that a vector V. So notice that like, if C is n by n, then how big is V? n minus 1, thank you. Okay. So do you guys understand this block matrix notation? I'm sure you've probably seen somewhere else. Chris is nodding, which is good, because he's supposed to teach it to you. 
Um, OK, uh, so C is symmetric. So what, what should go up here? V transpose. That's absolutely right. You see that? So you take the first column, you flip it, you get the first row. Right? That's what symmetry means. OK, uh, and then we're just going to give a name to the lower chunk of this matrix. We'll call it C squiggle. This is kind of like you know, the x's we had in the previous lecture. We're, not, we're just going to do one step of forward uh, elimination here. Okay. So I'm going to apply an elimination matrix. Remember what forward substitution looks like. I kind of multiply by a lower triangular matrix. Now, in the previous lecture, we, we, we multiplied, like in particular, to do forward substitution, we multiplied by a bunch of matrices that kind of looked like one, and then like a bunch of zeros, and then like a single element, and then a bunch more zeros. And then everything else was like one down the diagonal, right? Because it was like identity plus constant times e, e transpose, right? And then a bunch of zeros like that. I realize this is a very sloppy matrix, but hopefully you understand what I'm saying. I'm using this more as a way to rate limit the words that come out of my mouth than a meaningful diagram. OK. Um, so now, if, if we take a product of a bunch of these matrices, like if I do all the forward eliminations of the first column like all together, what I'll end up with, which is something you can verify at home, is a matrix that kind of has the following form. It has a 1, and then all the forward elimination values down the first column, and then 1's down the diagonal, like that, zeros up here, and zeros down there. We look, I see furrowed eyebrows. That's OK. Um, you guys see what this matrix is doing? It's taking copies of the first row, and then it's copying them down with these coefficients to the other rows and adding them. This is like a compressed version of the whole set of forward elimination steps in one matrix for the first column. Agree, disagree, agree to disagree. Just total silence, laptop time, iPhone, whatever. Cool. Yes? Yes, everything above the diagonal is zero. Remember, in forward substitution, we only ever deal with lower triangular matrices. Yeah. Okay, so this is a lower triangular matrix with ones down the diagonal something down the first column, and then zero in the sort of n minus 1 triangle down here. That's what this thing looks like. OK, so let's give this matrix a name. And now here's, here's a kind of fun thing that I'm going to do, just for fun. I'm going to replace this 1 with another value, which is the square root of C11. And this is just for, just for fun. So this is only going to affect the very first row of my forward elimination. right? I'm going to scale it by, by a constant. If you like, I'm going to take this matrix and pre-multiply it by the square root of C. It's kind of a goofy way to do it, but, but you could. OK? So in other words, I'm going to pre-multiply this thing by a matrix that looks like this. So I'm going to, I'm sorry, 1 over the square root of C11. OK? So R here is going to be like the x's that I've drawn in the diagram. And then the rest of this, hopefully you agree, is the same as what I've written on the board, right? Because we've got kind of like an identity going on down there. OK. So what is this thing going to do? It's going to forward substitute and it's going to scale the first row not by 1 over C11, which is kind of what we want in, but by this kind of weird constant. So you're going to bear with me for a minute. So I'm going to end up with, like, what am I going to end up with? Let's, let's think it through for a second. <laughs> Sorry, getting ahead of myself. I get so excited about, about matrix factorization. OK, so here's going to be our elimination matrix E. And again, we're going to, just for science, we're going to put 1 over the square root of C11. 0 transpose some value, whatever it is, we'll just say r, and then identity. So this is like the usual elimination matrix, but we're just putting a different constant in the corner. OK? OK. So first of all, sanity check. What, like, as we derive algorithms, you should be like trying to catch your professor in sloppy math mistakes. I know you all want to anyway, especially this one. But <laughs> sorry, I'm going to pick on you today. Um, Sorry, I, I, where, where, what could go wrong with this expression? I just blithely define a matrix for you. What have I not checked? Yeah. Yeah, C11 certainly can't be 0, because 1 divided by 0 is God knows what. It's, it's actually an open question. And, and, and moreover, is that the only invalid version of, of C11? Negative, right? Any value less than or equal to 0 here is, is problematic. So the very first thing I need to do before I define E is make sure that it's kosher, this little like sneaky like change to my elimination matrix that I'm trying to sneak past you all. Yeah? So any idea how can we check that this is valid? 
here's my small proposition. Maybe I'll, I'll pretend to be a mathematician. Let's see, look at that. Um, how, how might we, we prove this? This is actually, we can use a sneaky trick from the previous couple lectures. Oh, sure, yeah. So we'll assume our matrix is positive definite for now. Yep. So essentially, we, the, only, the only thing we know about our matrix, <laughs> because we know this isn't generically true, like the matrix of all zeros <laughs> does not satisfy this. So it must be something special, and we only know one thing about C, which is that it's positive definite. Right? So somewhere in there, we expect to have V transpose CV. Yeah? The only thing we know how to, but, and, and conveniently, <laughs> that's, that's uh, giving me an inequality. So what V should I choose? E1. Thank you. So, if I take E1 transpose C E1, remember E1 is the first standard basis factor, so this is 1 comma 0 dot 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 0. Well, this is C11. <laughs> yeah? Okay. But what do we know? Well, we know because our matrix is positive definite, well, I just took a vector and conjugated by it. So this, oops, sorry, I really want that to be greater than or equal, but it's actually just greater because this is non-zero. It's greater than zero. Yeah? Cool. So, so far at least I haven't done anything invalid. I make my cute little, what do you call that, Halmus? Uh, and and we, can, we can move on with our, our proof, okay? Any questions so far? So again, what we've done so far is we've taken the standard elimination matrix, and if you like, we've pre-multiplied it by one additional matrix, which has one over the square root of C11. And uh, the good news is that um, that's kosher. <laughs> we haven't divided by zero or by imaginary number. Yes? Yeah, yeah, this is from the positive definite property here. Yeah. Because we have something of this form. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, fantastic. Is it okay if I re erase our little uh, expression here? So now let's do forward elimination. Our favorite thing, which is to, to like eliminate matrices by hand. Okay, so we're gonna do E times C, and we're gonna again kind of write it in block form, like that. So in general, okay, so, so I have a one over the square root of C11 uh, here. Right, so, so uh, in particular, actually, we can, just, we can just write it. I'm sorry, I'm being lazy. So we have 1 over the square root of C11, 0 transpose R identity, like that. And then we have C11, V transpose uh, V C squiggle, like that. Okay. Cool. So, first of all, um, let's actually just do this product, and then we're going to deduce a useful expression here. So, so. What's 1 over the square root of C11 times C11? Yeah, square root of C11. Good work. OK, uh, what's this product? So we have uh, 1 over the square root of C11 times V transpose, like that, plus 0 times C squiggle. So that's kind of nice. OK, we have R times C11 plus V, yeah. So that's, the C11 is a scalar here, so maybe I write it to the left, uh, like that. Okay, and then we have RV transpose plus C squiggle, like that. That part's actually not going to matter, but, but we'll just, we'll have it there for good luck. Okay. Everybody see what I did there, just two by two multiply? So, remember, we chose E to be a forward elimination matrix. So we know one additional thing. What happens after I apply forward elimination on the first column? Like, kind of by definition. So everything below the diagonal becomes, rhymes with hero, zero? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, that's zero. Okay, so now we just learned something about relationships between the, the sort of blocks in our, our matrix. Neato, huh? Okay. So now we're going to, just for science, we're going to do, now here's where we're going to depart from Gaussian elimination. So far, all we've done is Gaussian elimination with a weird factor in front. <laughs> this 1 over the square root of C11. But what do we know? We know that C is symmetric. So far, we've used positive definiteness, but we haven't really used symmetry. And in fact, 
is this matrix symmetric? No, I, because we've, we've pre-multiplied by E, but we haven't done anything on the right-hand side. So it, so it may not, not be symmetric anymore. So let's say, like, just for science, now you're going to see why I have that 1 over square root factor in, like, T minus 12 seconds. What could I do to maintain symmetry? I pre-multiply by E. I could post-multiply by E transpose. That's right. Yeah, this is a fantastic idea. Paul, Paul, Paul. Yeah. Um, this class is small enough, you're all in trouble. Um, okay, so, uh, right, so, just for science, because this certainly doesn't look like Gaussian elimination, now we're, now we're going rogue, we can compute the following product, which is E, C, E transpose, like that. Okay? So we already have E, C, so let's, let's copy that over. So we have um, square root of C11, we got a V transpose over the square root of C11, we have a zero here, and we have an R V transpose plus C squiggle, like that. Okay, and now we have to post multiply that by E transpose. Here's where your instructor is going to make an arithmetic mistake, so get excited. So this is one over the square root of C11. We've got an R transpose zero identity. Did I do that right? I think I did that right. Okay, now it's important not to think here, right? We're just gonna follow our nose. Um, so, this is the magic thing that's about to happen. What's square root of C11 times 1 over the square root of C11? 1! Now do you see why I put the 1 over square root of C11 there? Because I knew I was going to post-multiply by basically the same factor. Okay. So that's, that's pretty nice. And then plus 0 times the other guy. Now we have 0 times this thing, plus 0 times that. We still have a 0 there. That's pretty good. Okay. So now, now what? Um, we have the square root of C11 times R transpose plus, this is where I'm hoping to God we got all of our factors right, V transpose divided by the square root of C11, like that. And then um, other stuff, I don't know. Uh, no, that's fine, I'll, I'll write it. So it's R V transpose plus C squiggle, like that. Okay. Now I'm going to make two different arguments that both justify the same fact, which is what is this value? This looks like a big complicated vector. Zero. Why is that? What's that? Symmetry. That's right. We know that this is a symmetric matrix, right? We worked out the first column as one comma zero. So the first row had better also be 1 comma 0. So we just know that this whole expression is equal to 0. If you didn't believe me, or if, like, you want, if you're like more of an algebra and less of a geometry kind of person, that's perfectly fine. Um, if you go back here, notice that we showed that C11 times R plus V is equal to 0. And that's exactly the same as this expression up to a factor of square root of C11. Yeah? So either way, you end up in the same place. Isn't this magic? So do you see what happened? Essentially, we pre and post multiplied by E, and now we have a really beautiful matrix with not only zeros down the first column, but also along the first row. It's kind of like we're doing like forward and back substitution at the same time. Does that make sense? By the way, E is lower triangular, yeah? Now notice, I, I, wanna, I wanna review here. Could I do this for a generic matrix? No, do you see that? In fact. We use both of the properties to get here, right? Because in order to um, show that C11, I could take the square root of it, I needed uh, my matrix to be positive definite, yeah? And then to take one over that, I guess it needed to be non-zero. Uh, and moreover, uh, symmetry was how I got to the zero there, yeah? And positive definite can exist without symmetry. That's a, sort of a Philosophical question. I mean, like, like, no, I mean, it can in the sense that, like, you could have matrices where, like, B transpose times your matrix times, times B is positive, but that matrix isn't symmetric. So, for example, you could take any positive definite part, take the part kind of below the diagonal and just kind of add it to the above the diagonal instead and zero at the bottom. But in a sense, if you think about, like, V transpose AV, if I average V with its, A with its transpose, then, like, that expression wouldn't change. So like it's, 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 it's very uncommon, I think, to encounter positive definite matrices that are not symmetric. I'd, in fact, I'd encourage you to find one out there for me. So tell me I'm wrong. Okay. 
So what did we do? Well, we just applied elimination to uh, this matrix and got rid of the first row and the first column. And then we can do exactly the same thing recursively to D, right, to this lower uh, piece here, and we can keep doing it. And just like our argument before, what did we do? We showed that we started with C, and now we pre-multiply by a bunch of lower triangular matrices. We post-multiply by a bunch of upper triangular matrices, and we got the identity. So we can move those all to the other side, and we get a factorization, just like before. But notice in this case, our factorization is kind of nice, because the E's are the same on both sides. So in particular, we have justified a factorization, which is super famous. This is called Cholesky factorization, which is LL transpose, which is uh, a, a sort of a very common factorization for a symmetric positive definite matrix. Does that make sense? Incidentally, you guys should, I, I like, like this is a pretty picky group of students, so I'm surprised you didn't catch me. Um, this is a numerical analysis class. What is the other thing that I haven't told you how to do, if I'm being really kind of axiomatic here? I mean, so let's say I'm in double precision floating point. Most likely, I have a processor that knows how to add, subtract, divide, and multiply. Square root. That's right. Um, so now we're going to defer on that a little bit. Um, when we talk about root finding, we'll, we'll give a method for a square root. Um, but I think it's pretty common to kind of trust that, that, that your favorite programming language has a square root in it. Um, alternatively, if you don't like that, because that is slightly circuitous, um, the reason we do it this way, by the way, is that square root is a nonlinear problem. <laughs> um, so like we're in linear algebra, so anyway. Um, there's a slightly different matrix factorization out there. So right, so so far we've shown C equals LL transpose, like that. We can actually do a slightly different thing, which is like this little hack here was kind of unnecessary. I could have just put like a one here instead. And then when the smoke clears, what's gonna happen is this one won't be a one, it'll just be some other value. Right? So at the end of the day, when you complete that whole procedure, you're going to get a diagonal matrix, but it won't be the identity. So like a slightly uh, cleaner factorization is what we call LDLT. It's kind of funny because it's really LDL transpose, but people say it out loud as LDLT. Where essentially what you do is exactly this, but you just stick a 1 here instead of uh, the square root factor. And then the D is sort of like the diagonal thing that you get left when you do that, that, that procedure. Um, there's actually a few reasons to do this. Um, one is that it's square root free, right? We, we, didn't, we no longer needed that. Um, the other is that, that like, somehow like from a numerical stability standpoint, if you're being really picky, you're like dividing by a number here which might be close to zero. And so somehow you've, you've kind of isolated that operation in, in D. Yeah. Um, so that's a, a fairly common thing that, that people do. I think, um, and incidentally, I believe if you allow D to be signed, you can even have this factorization exist for some matrices that aren't positive definite. But that's outside of our discussion for today. Yes? So how does this change? C here is positive definite or mm -hmm. positive semi? Well, we've justified as positive definite. Um, you can also do a similar one for positive semi-definite. But th then you have to be a little, a little more careful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're going to do that a lot in this class. We'll do the kind of sloppy version. Uh, and, and then the reality is that it probably works for all matrices, uh, but you should be a little careful. Yeah. For example, uh, give me the Cholesky factorization of the matrix of all zeros. <laughs> it would just be the matrix of all zeros, right? That's lower triangular. Yeah. <laughs> so clearly, at least sometimes, it, it exists. Yeah. OK, so I've, I've justified to you so far that such a thing exists, but we don't have a particularly nice algorithm for computing it. I mean, you could like kind of work through these steps here and maybe reverse engineer an algorithm, but it would be kind of ugly, involve matrix multipliers and stuff. But now we can do kind of a sneaky thing, which is now that we know that this factorization exists, we can use the fact that we know that it exists to derive a nicer algorithm. So in other words, we're going to kind of write C in this form and then reverse engineer some nice formulas that are going to justify a technique. Does that make sense? I never really liked this story. I noticed that all numerical analysis books kind of teach it this way. There's, there's probably some other kind of nicely inverted one where they all fit together, but I, yeah. Okay, so um, here's going to be our, our algorithm for computing Cholesky. We're going to do it kind of like from the top down, like the, the upper triangle, and we're going to kind of fill in bigger and bigger blocks of this matrix. And we're going to do that with a sneaky uh, magic trick. So, and I'm going to flip my notes. These are really, like, as we move forward in this class, the calculations, I think, get kind of less hairy in a sense because pretty soon we kind of rise above the nasty indexing that you have to do in linear algebra. Um, 
but at least for the first couple weeks of this course, there's like a lot of indices we have to be careful about. Okay, so. Oh, I'm sorry. I hope it's okay to erase this because I already did. Um, yeah, that's true. You can go back and uh, watch me at uh, 2x speed, 1 half, whatever your preference is. Okay. So we're actually going to apply a very similar argument to what we did up here to derive our algorithm for Cholesky. This is one of many, by the way. There's a lot of, like for all these linear algebra problems, we're covering like one method, but the reality is there's like people that build their whole career on like making efficient versions of these things for different cases. Um, just a fun fact. So in general, let's say that I want to compute rho. We're going to like kind of work out a generic version for like, I want to compute rho k of my Cholesky factorization. And obviously, if I have a method for computing this, then I can kind of inductively apply it, as long as it's only in terms of rows 1 through k minus 1. Yeah? So let's say that I want to do that. Then I'm going to take L. I'm going to write it in kind of a weird way. This is a painful calculation, by the way. So like, put on your seatbelts and get excited for what's going to be kind of yucky here. OK? So um, we're going to take L, and we're going to divide it into blocks uh, as follows. Um, uh, sorry, I'm going to my notes because I know I'm going to get it wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, zero. Oh. Okay, so. And now let's, let's make sure that we understand what all these blocks are because I think it's easy to like agree with your professor and then look back at this proof and realize it's nonsense. Um, so so let's, let's, let's all agree that this is a reasonable notation. So here, what I'm doing is I'm isolating rho and column k. So this is rho k and this is column k of my matrix, okay? So LKK, this object here is a scalar. Right? This zero is kind of like a vector, right? Because this is just one column. This is a vector like that. This is a vector transpose. This guy's a vector. And everything else here is a matrix. Do we see that? And notice that since I've, I've kind of divided it in a nice square way, that this L11 is lower triangular, as is L33. But L31, I don't know anything about. <laughs> right? It's just, it's just a bunch of numbers. So this is just an indexing game. I'm just saying, like, I know L exists, so I can take the L that I know that it exists, and I can just isolate the kth row and column, and I'm just giving these things names because we're going to derive formulas for the different elements here. Cool? I hate this calculation. I really hate it. And I keep reworking it in the book, and every time it gets worse. And, some, and oddly, I can't recover the one before it. Okay. Um, so was, anyway, so, so we know. Um, what do you think we're going to do? Well, we only know one thing, which is that C is equal to LL transpose. So sadly for us, that means we have to do something that is not very enjoyable, which is we have to multiply matrices. In particular, we need to multiply L times its transpose. OK? So what is LL transpose? Well, we've got L, which I will copy, L11, LK, L31. 0, L, K, K, L, K, uh, twiddle, 0, 0, L, 3, 3. Okay? Now, who wants to transpose? I'm like tempted to like ask someone to come to the board as one of those like things that's really your professor being lazy, but we call it pedagogical device. Um, okay, so this is going to be L, 1, 1, transpose, 0, 0, like that. Next, we have L, K, transpose. L, K, K, L, K, transpose. Oh, no, I already did it wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that. Okay. Oh, in fact, it doesn't even matter. Oh, that, that's okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm being lazy. Okay. Um, we have an LKK there, we got a zero, we have LK prime transpose, L3, 3 transpose. 
Okay. Do we all agree that this is right? I think so. Yeah. Whew. Oh, except that. Yeah. Right, that's because I forgot. That true. <laughs> okay, now it's correct. Now here's the good news. We only need two elements out of this product. So I don't need to compute nine values, which is good because as you can see, your instructor is really terrible at matrix multiply. In particular, we are only going to compute the middle row of these. And in fact, it turns out the first two elements of the middle row are this. Now, of course, if you were Cholesky back in the like 16th century or whenever he was alive, I haven't the slightest idea. Actually, the 16th century is probably a little early. <laughs> um, I'm sure he, he, was, he didn't know any better, so he probably computed the whole matrix. You know, he's a sucker. But, but lucky for you guys, you have an instructor who has already done this calculation and happens to know that it's perfectly fine to <laughs> just say like the first element is whatever it is. Now, the good news is that <laughs> this uh, particular product is not so bad. We've got LK times L11 transpose. Ah. Uh, uh, oh boy. LK transpose L11 transpose like that. Yeah, plus zero plus zero. <laughs> That's not so bad. Then something, it turns out I don't care. Then something, so it turns out I don't care. Now we're going to do one more thing carefully, which is the middle uh, element here. So we've got LK uh, transpose times LK. Remember, LK is a vector. So this is actually LK norm squared, like that, plus little LK K squared, like that. OK? And then there we go. Painful part is done. Everybody with me so far? Okay. I claim this gives us an algorithm. Um, <laughs> it's not obvious, but, but let's, let's think through why. Um, so in particular, what do we know? This is equal to C, right? So this is really equal to, um, you know, I could say this is like C11, um, maybe CK, uh, CKK. C31, um, C, right? I can basically put exactly the same expressions for C, right? Remember, the input data is C. The output is L, yeah? OK. So in particular, we get two really useful expressions, right? The first one, if I take transposes here, is L11 times LK is equal to CK, like that. Now it's looking pretty clean. Yeah? And moreover, CKK is equal to LK squared plus LKK squared. Whew. Cool? All right. Which one do we want to work with first? How about the first one? Because it's, it's, it's first. OK, so let's number these. So here's something kind of cool. Let's think about this expression spiritually. So first of all, L11 is a lower triangular matrix. Yeah? And let's say that our algorithm is going to do the following. It's going to compute row 1 first, then row 2, then row 3, then row 4, then row 5. So if I'm computing LK, notice that I've already computed L11, right? Because that is rows 1 through K minus 1. Sneaky, huh? So I know this value. I know this vector because I'm just reading it off from my matrix. <laughs> so what is this thing? Yeah, this is a k minus 1 by k minus 1 lower triangular solve. <laughs> yeah? Just for review, how much time should that take algorithmically? Yeah, k, k squared, or really, you know, if, you're, if you want to be precise about it, k minus 1 squared time. You know, but whatever. So we're going to just upper bound that by n. <laughs> OK? Isn't that cool? So now, like, notice in the order of operations now, now what have we filled in? We've filled in L11 and the vector LK. So now, like, if we're, if we're kind of scorekeeping here, like, we knew this inductively. We now have computed this vector. 
Now let's take a look at this expression. Conveniently for us, we can just isolate. So, what do we know? Well, we know that LKK squared is equal to the square root of C. Oh, no. Oh, gosh. I got ahead of myself. <laughs> is equal to CKK minus LK squared. Like that. So now we're cooking with gas. Yeah. So what do we know? Well, we know then that LKK is equal to, well, at least plus or minus the square root of CKK minus LK squared, like that. Does that make sense? So we're like almost there, right? We can taste it. Like we know we have the first K minus one rows, and we have everything up to sign for the K row. Yeah? What are we to do? Well, it turns out we can do whatever we want. Like, <laughs> so if you take L, and you multiply it by some diagonal matrix of like, you know, plus ones and minus ones, right? When you compute LL transpose, all of these just cancel out and you get the identity. So you can choose any sign that you want here and it doesn't matter. Um, but in particular, we can just put a plus. Because <laughs> um, I think we usually like to have L have positive values down the diagonal, just by convention. Does that make sense? And that's it. Notice that, that like implicitly we here, we have an algorithm, right? So we fill in L kind of row by row. Right? I guess technically we need to figure out the very first element of L, but I'll let you do that one at home. Basically just like this case here. <sighs> okay, so then, then what do we do? Well then, we, we, we first fill in our, like this sort of part of the row up to the diagonal by solving a lower triangular system. And then we compute the diagonal one just with a formula. Isn't that nice? So that's our algorithm. Um, what is the runtime of our technique? And now you know the answer, Axel. So, cubic, right? Because each one of these things took quadratic time. K is less than n here. And then we did n of them, right? Because we moved through all the different rows. Um, so this whole thing takes the same runtime as uh, uh, Gaussian elimination, LU factorization, whatever, asymptotically. Although it turns out if you like do the accounting a little more carefully, this one's actually a little faster. Yeah. Cool? Um, so yeah, so there's our, our derivation. Sorry, it's also on the slides. Um, oops. Oh, no. Um, right, so, the, uh, so essentially what we've, we've justified so far is that we can compute this thing fairly efficiently. Um, this is certainly easy to write code. It's like a, a few for loops, which is kind of nice. Okay. Um, incidentally, uh, I think this also kind of justifies, like when we talk about positive definite matrices, I think like oftentimes in like undergrad linear algebra class, this is just like this mystic, like mystical property. Like, oh, if we know matrices are positive definite, then there's like all these things we can do, right? And like it's totally unclear why. But hopefully, the Chelsky factorization is one way to kind of see what's going on, which is that any time I have x transpose cx, I can substitute in uh, the, the Chelsky factorization like that, and really, it's um, this, right? So essentially, like in some sense, you know, what Chelsky factorization is sort of justifying, this is not the only way to justify this fact, by the way, um, is that this like funny x transpose cx thing when we talk about positive definite condition, in some sense, what it's saying is like, when does this thing, when does this quadratic form secretly look like the norm of a vector squared? <laughs> right, that's really what's going on. Incidentally, when we talk about eigenvalue decomposition, we could do the same thing, you, but you get a very different uh, factorization. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, yes. It's okay, you can ask questions. No, I was gonna say, there's some relationship That's right. Does yeah. anybody, anybody know the anybody know the relationship? I think it's negative for positive definite and negative. You're thinking too hard. A positive definite matrix has positive eigenvalues. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Negative definite matrix has negative eigenvalues. Yeah. Um, right. So so later on, just by the way, if I have a positive definite matrix by the spectral theorem, I can also take uh, I can put its eigenvectors into a, a column matrix like that and write it as uh, this, where this is a diagonal matrix of the eigenvalues, and these are the eigenvectors, like that. Notice that this is sort of spiritually similar, because D, as you mentioned, if it's positive definite, I can compute a square root. So I can sort of distribute D onto these two terms, right? So this is really like, um, I guess, 
square root d phi transpose <laughs> square root d phi, like that. So this is like a very similar factorization to Cholesky, but this is not lower triangular. Yeah. So there are a lot of different ways to write positive definite matrices. Yeah. Here the columns are orthogonal, not orthonormal anymore because we put that d there. Um, and here the columns uh, follow the lower triangular pattern. So you, you've added different assumptions. Yeah. Anyway, this is foreshadowing because guess what we're going to do in a couple weeks is compute eigenvalues, like so many of them. Um, and, and, and that's uh, going to be a, fat, a property that comes up. Okay, so notice, why did we go to all this work? Just to review our story a little bit, we started with the least squares problem, and we showed that specifically for the least part, the squares problem, and in fact, problems that kind of spiritually looks like least squares, even if we didn't realize it, like, we can do better than that. We can use Cholesky factorization, discover additional structure in our matrix, and in fact, if we do LDLT, this is a particularly numerically kind of stable way to do this, this, this problem. Um, I'm just gonna kind of give you guys some pointers toward other specially structured matrices to get you thinking about other problems that this kind of reasoning would apply to. Um, sadly, in this course, except maybe toward the end, I can like take a vote on like bonus topics if we have a couple extra lectures. Um, we can talk about other nicely structured matrices and how we might solve them. Um, a different nicely structured type of matrix is one that's sparse. Sparse matrices are like matrices that are mostly zeros, right? Um, so like, uh, you know, for example, oftentimes if I'm solving a differential equation, then I have like a bunch of relationships, you know, I put my variables on a grid, and I'm like, trying to resolve a bunch of relationships between like variables and their neighbors. And so that's like maybe where one of these sparse matrices comes from, because there's only non-zeros for like neighboring pairs. Or like similarly in graph theory. Um, in that case, like, we might actually only have a linear number of non-zero values. So it might not even make sense to store our matrix as just like a big n by n grid of numbers, because most of those numbers could be zero. So like, for instance, a really dumb format might be just like a list of triplets, row, comma, column, comma, value. Right, this is a perfectly valid way to store a matrix. Do you see that? Right, so here's a problem in Gaussian elimination. Let's say that I want to be uh, evil here. Let's say I have a matrix that, and in fact, actually, now that I look at this example, a slightly better example would be if I took the first column here and I put X's down the first column as well. Um, let me draw what that looks like. Ugh. So in particular, oh, I wish there were an allergic to chalk, man. If I write L, or not L, oh no, I'm thinking Cholesky. If I have a matrix I want to solve, and it has the following sparsity structure. So it has like a bunch of non-zeros along the first row and the first column and then just the diagonal. Everything else is zero, yeah? This matrix obviously has order n values that I have to store, right? Just like the first row, the first column, and the diagonal. What happens if I do Gaussian elimination? <laughs> Think about the very first step of Gaussian elimination. It takes copies of the first row and has to cancel out all these x's. <laughs> Right? So once I do Gaussian elimination, well, now <laughs> I did n annihilate all these x's, right? I got a bunch of zeros here. But what happened to all the remaining entries here? All of them could be non zero, right? <laughs> so in one step of Gaussian elimination, I've completely destroyed the sparsity structure of my matrix. Does that make sense? So there are other algorithms um, out there that what they try to do is they say like, well, like if I reshuffled Gaussian elimination, for example, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. Like maybe if I took my matrix and I flipped the first and the last column, right? Then suddenly like all the forward elimination steps at least preserve the upper triangle. And maybe, maybe there's even better stuff I could do, right? And so, you know, just the same way that we talked about pivoting, a different reason why you might want to permute the rows and columns of your matrix is to avoid what people call fill in numerical analysis, which is any time you do like a forward substitution and replace the number that you thought was zero with something that's potentially non-zero, right? And so there's this whole other class of algorithms out there for numerical linear algebra where their goal in life is not just numerical stability, but it's efficiency. And efficiency here is counted by floating point things and fill inside of your matrix, right? So for example, um, a very common thing to do is sparse Cholesky factorization. We have a positive definite matrix and maybe now you permute the rows and the columns so that the L has as many zeros in it as possible. Fun, fun, fun question, by the way. Do you think that that's algorithmically um, feasible? 
This is actually an optimization problem, right? Minimize the number of non-zero entries in Cholesky factorization of any permutation of the rows and columns of the matrix. Yeah. Chris is shaking his head. You want to give me a proof why? Yeah, you have the right intuition. Um, essentially, this is an NP-hard problem, <laughs> which is to find the best possible, sparsest possible Cholesky factorization of a matrix. Um, that said, there's some really fantastic heuristics out there, um, and, and so there's, you could teach an entire course on just sparse linear algebra. In fact, many universities that aren't at MIT, because we're really bad at numerical analysis, have such a course. Um, and they're all about like cool strategies. They often look very combinatorial, actually. It kind of doesn't matter what the x's are. It's just more like the pattern of x's that matters here. Um, so to kind of work through like, well, if I permute things, then I kind of know this forward substitution step isn't going to do anything. Um, so there's some really nice heuristics out there. Okay. Um, so anyway, if you like this kind of stuff, uh, I encourage you to read about these algorithms and then never implement them unless it's your job to implement them because they're really hard to get right. <laughs> Okay, um, and in fact, that's only a, like one other example of a structured matrix. Um, here's another one, which is called a banded matrix. These are matrices that like there's only certain diagonals of the matrix that have non-zero values. Um, these also have beautiful algorithms for solving them cleanly. Uh, and in fact, in this case, you notice that like I could store three arrays of like basically length n here to store this particular matrix. Um, but once again, if I do forward substitution on that, I'm host. <laughs> Um, this particular matrix here, where there's the diagonal, one uh, sort of diagonal above and below it. Do you guys know the, the name of this particular system? Yeah, this is called a tridiagonal matrix. Um, its inverse is dense, sadly. <laughs> but it turns out you can um, factor it in a really clean way, and in fact, they're very efficient algorithms for solving these things. If you want like a good homework problem, which isn't actually on your homework, but I was tempted, <laughs> it's to write like a nice, efficient algorithm for solving tridiagonal matrices. And essentially the way that you can do it is by just kind of stepping through Gaussian elimination and noticing that like forward substitution doesn't have to take place quite as much. So like for instance, notice that like in the first column I only have to forward substitute once, right? But then sneakily, what happened to the fill? Well, it only actually filled something that I already knew was non-zero, <laughs> right? So anyway, those are sort of hint to like, like forward substitution, back substitution on this matrix is actually pretty clean. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and that's only the tip of the iceberg. I could do this for days. Um, yet another one is cyclic matrices. So like here's an example where like every row is a permutation of every other row. These could be invertible, um, right? Like permutation matrices are, are, have this structure. Um, but uh, there are other ones where you have to be a little careful how you invert. Um, if you're curious, this particular one has nice connection to Fourier transform. Um, so there's like a whole other class of, of algorithms out there for, for, for solving. Okay, so that concludes our, our discussion of positive, definite, and semi-definite and nicely structured matrices. Now we have one more question that we have to answer before we can leave solving linear systems behind us forever. <laughs> and by that I mean use it as a fundamental tool for the rest of this course. And that is the following. We have justified that we can solve this problem. The next question we should answer, of course, is should we? <laughs> Right? In other words, if we look at a linear system of equations, do we expect our solution to be particularly reliable? Right? Because notice we, there are plenty of ill-conditioned matrices out there that like Gaussian elimination will like happily try to invert, but it might do so and, and in the process like introduce a bunch of like totally wild ginormous numbers that we should we have no business working with. Okay? So this is gonna be like the main numerical problem where we're gonna do really careful calculations involving sensitivity and conditioning. A lot of the stuff that we do at the beginning of this, of this course is to like give you a taste for what like math people do in numerical analysis, and then we're going to drift off a little more into application land. Um, but I do think it's important to at least appreciate these kind of calculations and know that like sometimes there are very slick formulas out there that are actually kind of annoying to justify. <laughs> and, and even in linear algebra, uh, that's certainly the case. Okay. So in particular, the kind of question that we want to answer is like, you know, Gaussian elimination works in theory, but if we're in floating point precision, you know, our code outputs some x naught but like things surrounding and everything else, <clears throat> we now have some small residual, but it's not zero. We want to know how much we can trust that solution. Does that make sense? Notice, what do we call the quantity that I've written on the screen here? What is this thing? It's the error that I know how to evaluate. Yeah, I love that you guys are mouthing it, but you won't raise your hand or speak up. No, it's, it's, I'm just, there's like a fascinating, it's like kind of 
psychological effect here. Um, and yeah, this is called backward error because this is the thing I can actually compute, but I have no idea how close x is to the true solution to my problem, right? Those are two different notions of error. Hopefully that, that kind of makes sense, yeah? Okay, so again, that is uh, this notion of backward error, which is the amount that I have to kind of change the statement of a problem in order to uh, realize the, the, the solution that we actually got, right? So like, for instance, when we compute square roots, if you recall, like, we can't compute how close our numerical square root is to the true one, but what we can do is square it and see how close that is to the, the squared value, yeah? Okay, so our goal for this lecture, or possibly the next one, because as always I'm talking too much, but it's good because we're like ahead of the schedule for this course, um, is the following, you know, essentially, let's say that if I perturb A and B when we solve AX equals B, I want to know how much X changes, right? And then what we're going to see is basically a relationship between perturbing the problem statement, that's like the A and the B, and the solution, which is what we're kind of after. Does that make sense? We're going to derive a real nasty formula for this. It's going to tell us everything we want to know. Okay? Um, there's only two ways to understand this formula. One is like, at the end of the day, the A and B that we probably actually wanted to solve are already approximate, right? Like you have to round them and store them in double precision floating point. We want to know how far X is away from that. And the other one is like, if X isn't exact, like how could we perturb A and B to make it exact, right? These are sort of two dual sides of the same coin. So before we do that, sadly, we have to make a bit of a digression. So my guess is that today we'll do the digression and then the beginning of next lecture, we'll return to this calculation here and, and actually work out the perturbative analysis, um, which I promise we won't do for the rest of this course because it's ugly and boring. Okay, so um, there's a word here we keep using which is small. <laughs> And you might have noticed in the calculations of this course, for example, I, I bet it's existing on one of the boards here. Yeah, um, I've chosen to be really paranoid about notation that you probably are not used to from linear algebra class, which is this little two down here. Right, like I think usually we're used to just leaving that out when we take norms of vectors. And there's a reason, which is that when we say the norm of a vector is small, we need to say small with respect to which norm. And what we're going to find, for example, in the homework that I'm sure you've all completed, is that our notion of perturbative analysis and condition numbers and all this stuff actually depends on what, what norm we choose. There's a different formula, right? Um, so, and sometimes, like, honestly, one, one thing we often do is choose the norm that's convenient for computing a condition number. Like, it could be the L2 condition number is some ugly formula involving eigenvalues, and, like, the L infinity one is just, like, the biggest element in a matrix or something like that. Um, okay. So um, we have to have a slight mathematical digression here to talk about how we measure the length of vectors. For many of you, this is review, but I don't care. Um, right, so in particular, uh, we need a, a notion of a norm, right, which is a way to compute the length of things. And uh, in this class, we need a norm of two things, because notice when we did perturbative analysis, there were kind of two things we wanted to be small in this expression, right? One is like B, delta B here. The other is delta A, so we also need a norm on matrices. That, might, that part might be new. Okay, so in general, a norm is a function that satisfies these three properties. I think we've all seen this in some context or another, right? That the norm, the length of a vector is zero if and only if the vector is actually zero. Um, it has a scaling property and a triangle inequality. If I'm moving too fast, please let me know. Um, and I think oftentimes when we say norm, colloquially what we mean is the L2 norm, which of course is the square root of the sum of the squares. And in this class, I've tried to be really paranoid about putting that subscript here, because it really does matter in, in the calculations that we're doing. Okay? But of course there are many other norms out there that satisfy those three axioms. For example, the LP norm is just like the pth root of the sum of the pth powers. Um, the L1 norm is like the sum of the absolute values. Right? Um, sometimes we call this the taxi cab or the Manhattan norm. Anybody know why? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Like if I'm driving, you know, Manhattan, here's my map of Manhattan, roughly. There's Times Square, you can tell because it's, uh, it's a square. Um, if I get in a taxi cab and I want to go from A to B, you know, it's not, I don't get to like, <laughs> well, most of us don't drive straight through, you know, Madison Square Garden when we do that. Um, instead, we have to move along roads that are orthogonal. So actually, there's like sort of the absolute value rather than like the square root of the sum of the squares when I'm driving in, in Manhattan. Okay? Or if I take uh, P to infinity, uh, I can justify the, uh, the following formula, which is what we call the infinity norm, 
which is just the biggest absolute value of any element in a vector. Okay. Now, <laughs> norms are different. Is what I want to. That's like essentially what I'm trying to communicate to you guys. Is that different notions of big and small really matter here? There are a lot of ways to visualize that. One of my favorite ones um, is this kind of picture here. I don't know if you guys have seen this thing before, but this is the unit circle <laughs> in different norms. So this is like. Uh, Oh no, I committed the cardinal sin and wrote on the board that doesn't move. Um, so this is like the set of vectors. Uh, here's my unit circle, set of x such that x with respect to whatever norm is equal to 1, <laughs> right? So if I put a 2 there, I draw an actual circle. And as I move p around, um, I get these other funny shapes, like a diamond and a, and a square. Um, so notice that like, you know, if I consider everything inside of there to be small in some sense, I've, I've sort of changed what that might mean, right? If you're wondering, we can do p less than 1, but it's no longer a norm. And then the sides of this thing kind of start squeezing inward. This is important if you're in compressive sensing, for example. Um, and in fact, what we're going to see is for this chunk of this course, we're mostly going to deal with the 2 norm. And then when we start talking about nonlinear problems, we'll deal with the rest of these. Um, and they have important properties. So for example, just for a small digression, let's say that I solve the following property, uh, uh, problem rather. So remember, we did Tikhonov regularization, which I believe is on your homework, so you all know now that this is uh, like that. Right, so this is kind of wanting x to be small with respect to the 2 norm, right? But there's a whole class of algorithms out there. We'll, we'll talk about them hopefully later in this course a little bit, where I put a 1, uh, and I probably don't square it like that. Um, this is in a field called compressive sensing sometimes, or sparsity regularization. And at least empirically, if you optimize these things, often what you'll find is that x will contain a lot of values that are precisely 0. Um, there's a lot of reasons why. <laughs> um, here's, here's one way to think about it. And in fact, I'll give you two explanations. So let's say this is the space of x's. And these are the solutions to ax equals b. OK? And let's say that alpha is really, really small, right? So, so, like alpha, so essentially, like we really want to solve this linear system. And if there's multiple solutions, for example, here, then we choose the one with the smallest one norm. Does that make sense? So one thing I could do is kind of grow little units, or I guess not unit circles anymore, but grow circles out of the origin with respect to the L1 norm, right? Kind of grow them bigger and bigger until I find the one that first runs into my system here, right? Because that's sort of the one that optimizes this, this value. Yeah? And notice, it ran into it in a very specific point right? on the y-axis. That wasn't a mistake. Actually, it was very high probability that's likely to happen. Notice the y-axis is exactly the point where there's a, precisely a zero value in x. Do you see that? Notice that this is different than, like, for example, let's say I did just circles. Now I'm going to get some non-sparse answer. Yeah? And so one reason that people like this is it somehow gives me the solution to ax equals b with the most zeros in it. So somehow it's like the simplest solution in some sense. Does that make sense? Um, a different explanation I really like, I think this comes from Daniela Witten. Um, she's a statistician, which is a really clever one. It's like, have you ever you know, watched kids running around a square table? Or like a table, it doesn't have to be square, like rectangle. Or like, have you ever done this yourself? If not, I encourage you to do this after class. I can set it up for you if you like. Um, and if you're like me, what are you trying to do? You're running around this table. And what's, what's likely to happen right at the edge of the table? That's where you tend to stub your toe. <laughs> it's right at that, that sharp point. And so one of the reasons we like this L1 regularization is with very high likelihood, you end up at the points of the, this unit square object, which in this case happen to be sparse vectors. Um, in any event, we'll, we'll come back. We, we don't know how to solve L1 problems yet in this class. We'll, we'll come back to this later. Um, but this is just to say that different norms have like qualitatively different effects on, on, on problems that we solve uh, in this class. That said, they don't have that different an effect. So uh, in particular, um, two norms are equivalent if they can be kind of bounded within a constant of one another. You guys kind of understand the definition on the screen here. So there exists two constants where I can take one norm and the other kind of scale the one up and down by these two constants and sandwich the first norm. And a fact that we are not going to prove in today's lecture is that actually all norms on Rn are equivalent. If you're curious how to prove this, it's really not so hard. It's just 
um, norms you can, you can very easily justify are continuous functions. Um, and so essentially what happens is uh, you optimize these things on the unit circle or the unit sphere, which is a compact set. And so like things that are continuous on a compact set have a max and a min. And this, this is essentially an encoding of that, of that fact. If you didn't know what that means, that's fine. You can take this at, at, at face, face value. Perfectly fine. Okay. But that said, of course, like, in real life, that might not be the case, right? Like, for instance, these two things are indistinguishable from perspective of the infinity norm. But of course, from perspective of the two norm and the one norm, like, these are very different points. Yep. Okay. Now, remember, we need to be able to perturb matrices and vectors. So far, we've talked about vector norms. How do I compute the norm of a matrix? Any ideas? I mean, like, it makes perfect sense to like, take that definition and just say a norm of a, of a matrix is a thing with those three properties, right? Like non-zero, that's it's symmetric, or not symmetric, sorry, I'm thinking distance, um, has that scaling property and a triangle inequality. So for one thing, if I have a matrix, my favorite kind of football <laughs> diagram here, I can take my matrix and I can just unroll it, right? I could take these elements and put them here. These guys, put them there. So I can always take an n by n matrix and make it into a vector of length n squared, right? So basically for every um, vector norm, I can compute a matrix norm by just doing the same thing on the, the matrix, right? So for example, the two norm of a vector, you know, I could do exactly the same thing on the matrix, just sum up like the squares of the elements of the matrix and take the square root. This particular norm has a special name. This is called the Frobenius norm. I think Frobenius, like, is a Latin sounding name, but if I recall, this is one of those, like, funny things in, like, what, 1700s, 1800s, where, like, you wanted to be pretend Latin, because that was, like, the fad in academia. Um, but, but in any event, um, I'll let you Google that and tell me why I'm wrong, which I'm sure will happen in, like, 12 seconds here. Um, yep, Chris already has. It turns out that this norm is like a little bit weird because we usually think of matrices as like things that act on vectors, right? Like you do matrix vector product and it's like really not obvious from this, this norm what that should do. And in fact, it depends on the basis that you write your, your matrix in, right? And so this is like not a very geometric quantity. So there's a different way to get a matrix norm, which is the following thing. For every vector norm, I can get what we call the induced norm of a matrix, which is the following. Um, essentially what we do is we say that the induced norm of a matrix is equal to the maximum value of AX applied to any X on the unit circle, where here both of these norms are vector norms. You guys see that? Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to let you guys check at home that these things are the triangle inequality, um, uh, or, or rather that this satisfies the triangle inequality. This is an easy uh, exercise. Um, but uh, let's, for fun, let's do a few exercises here. I'm trying to take it slow so that we get back to the course calendar. So we're like proving a few things with the slide skip. Um, in particular, like what is the two norm, the induced two norm of a matrix? Well, one thing we can do is just write it down. So um, what do we do? So we have max of AX2 such that the norm of X is equal to one, like that, right? That's essentially the, 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 the two norm of A. Just kind of unrolled that notation a little bit. How are we to solve this? This is a constrained problem. It's another one of these French names. This is just a calculus question. There's nothing, nothing. There's a prereq for this course, so I know you all have it memorized. Lagrange multiplier. Thank you so much. So what is the Lagrangian of this problem? This is um, x given lambda. Um, I'm actually going to replace this objective function, but we'll, I promise we'll come back and be careful about it with one half x transpose a transpose a x. Notice that this is one half times the objective squared. <laughs> so the minima are the same. Is everybody with me? Yeah? Okay. Um, so this is one half x transpose a transpose a x minus uh, lambda times one minus, obviously constraining um, in fact, let's, let's rewrite our, our constraint a little bit. I'm just being lazy because we're low on time, <laughs> um, which is this, I claim, is the same constraint, <laughs> right? Because if x has norm 1, then the square norm of x is 1, and 1 half the square norm is 1 half. 
Yeah? So these are all equivalent problems. I'm just doing this to, because I, I happen to know this will take my, make my arithmetic a little easier. <laughs> okay. Um, so in particular, this is 1 half minus 1 half the norm of x squared. Like that. Okay? So what do we do? This is our Lagrangian. We take the gradient with respect to x and we set it equal to 0. Yeah? This is good calculus review. I encourage everybody to go home and, and review this stuff. Remember, this is Lagrange multiplies. It's in the first chapter of the, the book, so you can take a look there. Um, so we get 0 is equal to the gradient with respect to x of uh, my Lagrangian, which I've called capital lambda here. OK. The derivative of this with respect to x is a transpose ax, right? just like our least squares problem. And the derivative of this guy with respect to x, well, we've got 1 half x squared here, so it's just x, right? So this is. Now you can see why I've built in all these 1 half factors. <laughs> because we set this thing equal to 0. So a transpose a x is equal to lambda x. What kind of a problem is this? This is an eigenvalue problem. Yeah. Um, so, in particular, we wanted to maximize this expression here. Now we know a little bit more, which is a transpose ax is equal to lambda x, right? So, we can say, well, this is the square root of x transpose a transpose ax, like that. You see that? Okay. Oh, remember, what is this expression? This is lambda x, right? So this is the square root of lambda times the square root of x transpose x. And what is this quantity? Five. It's always the math kids. They're always the smart asses in the room, you know? Any other guesses? You might have noticed that like, the answer to almost every question in this class is 1, 0, or, or doesn't exist. Usually not 5. Uh, no, so this is the square root of x transpose x. What is x transpose x? This is the norm of x. Well, we constrain the norm of x. So we go to 1. <laughs> yeah? So this is equal to lambda. Notice we want to maximize ax. So at the end of the day, the two norm of a matrix A, by the way, this is often confused with Frobenius norm, but this is the proper notation. This is the norm that is induced by the two normal vectors, is equal to the max, um, I guess you could say the square root of the max eigenvalue of A transpose A. So that's what we just showed. Does that make sense? So. First of all, compared to the Frobenius norm, which of these things is easier to compute? Frobenius norm is pretty darn easy to compute. It's just a formula, right? Remember that we started with this, this, this nice thing, and instead I'm telling you that somehow a better behaved norm is, is this guy. That's, that's absolutely right. In fact, we haven't even covered algorithms in this class yet for computing eigenvalues, right? By the way, there's a fancier name of, of putting this. This is the biggest singular value of A, if you know what that is. If you don't, that's OK. Um, but yeah, so what we're going to show is that like condition number with respect to this norm maybe it will be a nice looking formula even if this norm itself is kind of annoying to compute. For example, these are, these are the kinds of things that can happen. Okay, so we're out of time for today. Um, what we're going to start with next time is we're going to verify uh, probably just one of these two formulas just to kind of convince you that these things are different, um, which is that like to get the different induced norms of, of a matrix here. So these are different ways of measuring perturbations in A. Um, before we do that, one final trivia question. Are all matrix norms equivalent? We know all vector norms are equivalent. How many of vote yes? Two, three. How many of us vote no? Five. How many of us are like on our laptops, whatever, iPhones, you know, or check our email? A few of us. Um, yeah, uh, the, the yeses actually have it, right? Because in particular, <laughs> Every matrix norm is a norm on r to the n squared, right? Because I could have done the opposite. I could have taken that n squared length vector and reshaped it to an n by n matrix, right? So these are just special cases of, of vector norms. They're just very special ones for, for a squared thing. Okay. So in any event, in our next lecture, we'll very quickly justify one of these formulas. 
And then our goal is to work out the condition number of our problem for AX equals B. Right? That's what we're after for a particular norm. Okay? So with that, everybody, good luck on your homework. Chris has office hours after class today. I have office hours tomorrow morning. Um, you know, uh, and there's Piazza, but we prefer office hours because humans. Um, and with that, we will see you next time.